you, Sherilyn, Suzanne, and Gail. All right, if you have your Bibles, look with me in Matthew chapter 6. So, we've been preaching through the Gospel of Matthew. We are currently making our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, we had worked almost to the end of chapter 5. And uh, I realized that earlier this year, I had preached on Matthew 5, verses 43 through 48, which I'm sure you all remember. (laughs) So rather than repeat it, uh, we're going to move on to chapter 6. So if you feel like you've been cheated because you didn't get that last part of chapter 5, I believe that was in February, but you probably already remember, so you can go back and look at that. We'll pick up in chapter 6 here. So remember that Jesus is talking about how the king himself and the kingdom, where God rules, where God reigns, has come into the world, and that God's kingdom brings grace, that we participate in God's grace by receiving the word of the Lord, by doing the word of the Lord, and by God's grace, he uses his word to shape our character, to change our lives. It impacts our relationships, our circumstances, and on and on. God's grace changes everything. We obey God's word as a result of his grace. When we fall short of God's word, we fall on his grace. Everything is grace. And it's made real to us by the coming of Jesus Christ and God's kingdom into our lives. So in chapter 6... Jesus is going to address kind of the outward living and, and what really shapes our outward living. And we know that really, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the example we're wanting to follow is the example that Jesus himself gave to us. He's the model for all who would live in the kingdom of God. We know that Jesus was led by the Spirit of God in every facet of his life. Not, we know this not because he went through the physical act of praying, but because he sought out the presence of God. He expected to know the presence of God. He yielded to the presence of God. He acted on the presence of God. There was a direct connection between what Jesus did in secret with his Father and then his outward public lifestyle. That same connection exists for you and me. What goes on in those secret places between us and our Father impacts directly our outward public lifestyle. And so in the text today, Jesus is going to answer the question, what does it mean to be a spiritual person and to live a spiritual life? And when you start talking about that, you kind of have to define some terms. So spirituality, what we're talking about is when the unseen realities come to bear on the seen world that we live in. Uh, When the, the, the supernatural realities of God's Spirit affects and influences our words and our actions. So it... We believe as Christians, according to the Bible, that there are supernatural, unseen realities that come to impact and influence our lives and the world in which we live. And people who are spiritual people will live according to the unseen realities. The Bible says we live by faith and not by sight, right? Yes, good. Okay. So, is there a difference? between having the appearance of spirituality and actually walking by the Spirit of God. So, Jesus is concerned about what is real and what is ultimately fake or, 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 or phony. So the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality where God reigns, where His will is done, where God rules in our lives. That's a spiritual reality. It changes our lives from the inside out. So Jesus is concerned that people will have the outward appearance of a life yielded to the Lordship of Christ and that it won't be counterfeit. Or that he 
he's concerned that we won't live in such a way that simply puts on display a performance. But the way we live would be an actual reflection of the presence of God and the presence of God's grace working in our lives. So let's look at the text. Matthew chapter 6, I'll begin reading in verse 1. Jesus says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to, sta- to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth. They have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then in verse 9, Jesus goes on to teach His disciples how to pray. This is the Lord's Prayer. We're going to look at this next week. So skip down with me to verse 16. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. All right. Jesus in the text describes things like almsgiving, praying, and fasting. All would have been common in Jewish life. In verse 1, Jesus calls them all acts of righteousness. And so when we use that kind of language, acts of righteousness, we're talking about things a person might do to reflect their devotion to God. Now Jesus does not discourage these outward acts of righteousness. He himself did them. So are you following me? These are the things we do to show our devotion to God. The reality of our devotion to God, Jesus himself did them. Jesus and his disciples gave to the poor. They spent much time in prayer. Uh, Jesus usually prayed alone in solitude. He spent at least one period in an extended fast. Now, what Jesus is saying is that acts of righteousness do not necessarily mean that you are devoted to God or that you are actually righteous. Your acts of righteousness might reveal that you are devoted to God and righteous, but not necessarily so. So, this morning, I did some searching uh, on the internet. There's a popular uh, Christian store that has an outlet in South Texas. I'm not going to say its name. There's a store you can go and and buy. If you go to their website, they have a whole menu of, of things you can scroll through that you can buy that are all of a Christian nature. I looked in the section gifts and decor, and I was surprised by the number of categories you could search and buy products. For instance, in the gifts and decor section, you had Christian products you could buy for auto accessories, baby and toddler. I assume you're not buying babies and toddlers. 
You can buy candles and fragrances, cards and stationery, coloring for adults. What is that? You can buy crosses, everyday gifts, figurines, home and garden, journals, kitchen items, photo frames, spa and grooming products, which I was surprised because that interested me the most, that Jesus is concerned about what products I use to groom myself with. So there were many products made from goat's milk, which I wonder what's the significance of that. Apparently is very spiritual. Here, here's what I want to tell you, and I don't, I don't mean to be snarky. I can't help it. It's the language of my people. It's my heart language. But I want you to know that using Jesus' candles and nail clippers do not make you more righteous and spiritual. You understand that, right? I mean, God's not impressed with that at all. But we really impress ourselves and maybe others by our efforts to appear spiritual and righteous. And that... Some of that, I mean, it doesn't matter that you use Jesus' nail clippers. I just don't want you to misunderstand that somehow the Lord is pleased by that. And I get, and I, people tell me all the time, people make choices about their lifestyles and they describe those to me like I should be impressed. And I'm going to tell you, especially what I hear most is, well, I've decided that I'm only going to listen to Christian music. okay. I'm sure Jesus really appreciates that effort. I, I, it's okay to choose to only listen to Christian music, but I want to be clear, that doesn't make you a better Christian than anybody else. Are you following me here? Yeah. See, there's more to it than that. And Jesus is concerned that we've allowed ourselves to become so shallow that we are so impressed with ourselves. And Jesus wants us to know that the Lord expects us to go deeper. For instance, you know in the Gospels there were occasions where Jesus was criticized for the lack of outward signs of his spirituality. There were people who knew Jesus and they didn't think he was a very spiritual guy. Jesus, right? Yeah, and so in Matthew 9.14, the disciples of John the Baptist criticized Jesus and his disciples for not fasting like they do and like the Pharisees do. And in Luke 5.33, uh, the, 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 the disciples of John the Baptist uh, complain that Jesus' disciples were perceived as not being prayerful compared to the way that they prayed. And uh, it's like these others are saying, Jesus, you don't seem to be as devoted to God as the Pharisees or as John the Baptist's disciples. They do more spiritual things than you. And I think Jesus listened to that complaint and thought, really? I just I don't know what to do with that. And so Jesus teaches a different reality related to the kingdom of God. And so... I think this is what Jesus wants me to know. I experience personal transformation from within as I participate with God's grace by making Jesus my king and doing his word. This, this is what it all really comes down to. Using Christian goat milk hand lotion and wearing Christian t-shirts is not what changes my life. So in the text... Jesus tells me what is going to change my life. And, and we need to pay attention to these things. There are three things that Jesus tells us in the text. Jesus offers a warning about putting our spirituality on display like a performance to be rewarded. Then he offers an alternative to performance-based religion for his disciples to practice. Then he explains how personal transformation in our lives really happens. So let me unpack all of this for you. The first thing I want to tell you today is that Jesus says the real benefit of living a religious lifestyle to impress others is whatever praise I receive from those I impress. That's it. That's it. 
There will be no spiritual fruit, reward, or benefit from religious practices done to impress others. And so Jesus is critiquing the desire to create this impression of piety. Not only are we tempted to appear spiritual for the purpose of impressing other people, but we are prone to go to greater and greater lengths to get their attention and to show them how spiritual we really are. And Jesus picks up on this. In the text, he gives several exaggerated examples of this problem. In 6.2, he says, when you give your, your alms, do not announce it with trumpets. You know... In 6.5, he says, do not be like the hypocrites praying on street corners and in synagogues so as to be seen. In 6.7, he says, do not keep on babbling like, like pagans. He, it literally, he says, don't keep heaping up words on top of each other. That doesn't impress God. I know it impresses people. Oh, Lord, this thou our day art holy. Amen. God doesn't care that you can pray in King James language. No offense, but it doesn't impress the Almighty. That's not the point. And in verse 16, he says, when you fast, don't look somber. Oh, I'm so, I'm fasting today. Jesus says that hypocrites and pagans, people who do not really know God, can act religious for the purpose of glorifying themselves. Not everything we see in each other's lives is real, Jesus is saying. See, hypocrites and pagans are not trying to honor or serve God. They are not trying to draw closer to God. Their acts of righteousness are designed to enhance their own glory. They are not a part of God's kingdom. They are actually worshiping themselves. So outward religious actions are never a good indicator of one's spiritual life. They may be good indicators of a person's spiritual life, but they can also be fake. Are you following me? All right. There's a story of the owner of a French restaurant who has come up with a gimmick that has doubled his clientele in a matter of weeks. When a fellow comes in with his date... A smiling waiter hands each one an ornate menu, and the menus look alike, but on the one given to the man, the menu has the real prices, and in the menu given to the woman, the prices have been inflated dramatically. (laughs) So as the man orders the food, his date is struck dumb at his generosity. Good luck with that. Jesus says there will be no reward from God for practicing piety for the purpose of impressing others. There is no reward from God for this. Your reward comes only from those you've impressed. We get a choice between serving God with purity of heart or using God as a means to serving the idol of prestige. And whatever recognition... I receive from others for my behavior is the only benefit I will receive. And I think the question I need to ask is how much of my religious or spiritual practice is for the purpose of impressing others? What's really in my heart when I do the acts of righteousness? The second thing I want to point out is that Jesus commands his disciples to practice their faith and spirituality in a way that will bring reward from God, not others. So in the text, Jesus gives four strong commands for his disciples concerning what to do about practicing righteousness. If they will yield to the, Lord, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in these areas, if they will obey God's Word in these areas, their acts of righteousness will be real and more beneficial to them. Four commands. In verses 3 and 4, Jesus says, Do give alms, just do it in secret. In verse 6, Do pray, but go into your room and shut the door. In verse 9, 
He says, pray in this way. And then he teaches them what we call the Lord's Prayer. As I said, we'll look at that later. In verse 17, he says, do fast, but put oil on your head and wash your face so that no one will know that you're fasting. Now, the result of doing what Jesus says about acts of righteousness is the same in each example. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And Jesus is saying, if you will do what I'm telling you here, then your Father will know, and He's the one who will reward you. Reward is coming for our faith and our obedience, but the reward comes from who? There are benefits from my acts of righteousness and obedience to God's Word. Those benefits come from God. And, when, and they come when we do these acts of righteousness with the right motive. Now, it is difficult for me to be involved in any form of public worship or piety and be focused only on God and not on what others are thinking. So Jesus directs me to do the acts of righteousness with an audience of one. So he encourages us to pray, but he says to pray simply and to do it in secret. He encourages us to give alms, but to give alms in secret, to fast in secret, and therefore avoid the temptation of seeking rewards from both God and people. Jesus knows that we crave recognition. We, we want to be counted as spiritual. We want to be respected as godly people. We want to be significant and honored for something special about us. And so to counter that temptation, Jesus invites us to find our significance in God and in God's kingdom by doing these acts of righteousness for an audience of just one. So the question I need to ask is my understanding for my personal significance ground in Jesus Christ and his kingdom or in what others think of me. See, really, if I draw my significance from what other people think, then I'm going to want to let people know the extent of what I'm doing so that I can receive my reward from them. But if I've grounded my significance in the presence of Christ and his kingdom in my life, then I just have an audience of one. All right, the third thing I want to tell you today is that my personal intimacy with God the Father is the key to avoiding my sinful motives in doing acts of righteousness. The way to avoid the wrong motive is found in my personal relationship with God the Father. In verses 1 through 18, there are eight references to God as your Father. And these references indicate the extraordinary intimacy and trust that Jesus experienced with God and he invites us to experience as well. There are three references to your father who sees in secret. Verses 4, 6, and 18. Here's what Jesus is saying. God the Father enters caringly into the secret place of my life where, the deepest, where my deepest cares are found and from where my words and actions are born. My words and actions should spring from that secret place in my life where I dwell intimately and constantly in a relationship with God the Father. That is the essence of prayer. I cannot say clearly enough, prayer is not an event. It is dwelling in the presence of the divine. It is living in the realities of God's kingdom all the time. Of course there are times where you and I pray, especially in groups maybe, but it is always more than that. It is dwelling in the presence of God. When I pray and dwell with God in that secret place in my life, I learned that I can trust God in all things because He provides all that I need. I can respond to God in a way that allows Him to shape my behavior. In other words, when I trust God and when I open my life up to His grace, to His heavenly reward, His provision, then I can live differently. In verses 11 and 12 of verse 5, I can bear persecution patiently. 
I can also let go of my anger and resentment and risk vulnerability of reconciliation in chapter 5, verses 21 and 26. I can live and speak with integrity and responsibility without falsehood or evasiveness from chapter 5, verses 33 through 37. Or I can pursue what is best for my enemies rather than what is best for me according to chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. And I can continue in secret yet persistent prayer just like Jesus Himself. I must meet with God in that deep, secret, intimate place in my life and learn to trust Him and allow Him to change me in that place. And I live from that place. Much of Jesus' deep and extensive prayer life was not just speaking to God, but listening for God's will. And then having discerned the will of God, Jesus responded to the will of God. He acted on it. He lived it out for all to see. And certainly my prayer life will involve giving adoration and thanks to God. It will involve uh, making requests in light of the will of God. But it will include the reality that I am in the presence of God all the time. And when I pray, I understand that God will reveal His will to me. He will speak to me. He will give me His Word. And when I hear God's Word, I will know it. And then I will have to decide whether or not I will act on the Word of God. The truth is, the more I seek, the more I listen, the more I discern, the more I respond with faith and obedience, the more of God I receive. Spiritual response is rewarded with more of the Spirit. I then live in such a way that the Spirit speaks and acts in and through me. I am no longer moved by the things of the world, especially by the acclaim of people, but I am moved by God's Spirit. There's a story of a priest who was coming back to his rectory one evening in the dark when he was accosted by a robber who pulled a gun on him and demanded, your money or your life. And as the priest reached into his coat pocket, the robber saw his priestly collar there and uh, said, I see you're a priest. Never mind. You can go. And the priest was so relieved that he tried to show his thankfulness to the robber by offering him a candy bar. And the robber replied, no, thank you, Father. I don't eat candy during Lent. <laughs> so if this story was about a Baptist preacher, say me, uh, I would have given in to my sarcastic nature and said, so God is touched and impressed by how you can go without candy during Lent. So touched, in fact, that God doesn't care that you're robbing me at gunpoint. I mean, who do you think we're fooling? And then he would have shot me right there on the spot. <laughs> I think you get what I'm saying. Outward behavior and words will reflect the presence of God in that deep, secret place in my life. I need to live from that place in my life. That place where I meet with the Lord. Consistently, constantly, authentically. Where I die to myself. And God's Spirit uses God's Word to bring me alive. And to make me like Christ. The question I want to ask is, am I living out of a spiritual... Am I living out a superficial faith? Instead of living out of the deep, secret place where I encounter and respond to the presence of God. What is my life? What's the truth of my life? So today, I want to invite you to consider two different kinds of commitments. First of all, I invite you to invite God, the Father, through the Holy Spirit, into that secret part of your life that is the source of everything you are, everything you say, and everything you do. Draw close to God, and He will draw close to you. I invite you to open up your life and invite Him in.
allow him in. When you do that, he comes in and lives with you. Secondly, I invite you to turn away from a superficial, people-pleasing, performance-based faith and live out of the deep, secret place where you encounter and respond to the presence of your God in your life. Make a commitment today that you're going to have an audience of one. And choose to live out of that place where you've met with the Lord. And allow that to shape all of your life. Make that commitment today. In a moment I'll pray and then Alan Ray will come and lead us in a time of response. And I wonder how do you need to respond to the Lord today? And after we pray while we're singing you can respond to God right where you are. Or if you feel led you can come to the altar and pray. If you feel led I'll be standing here while we sing. You can come and pray with me. And then when this service is over I'll be out in the foyer for a time. If you feel led, I would love to visit with you about what God is saying to you or to talk to you about what questions you have. I'll be out there. This is our time to respond to the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that today I and all of us would open up our hearts to you, our lives to you, And allow the light of truth to shine into the deepest and perhaps darkest parts of who we are. But we want to invite you into that secret place in our lives. That place where no one else goes. But we want to open the door to you. To come in and draw close to us. And Lord, it is in that place that we want to meet with you. To hear your word. And to hear how we need to respond to your word. So that we can be made like Jesus. May your grace abound in that deep, secret, intimate place in our lives. And may your grace shape us into the likeness of Jesus. May your grace lift us up when we fail. And put us back on uh, the right track again. And Lord, I, I know that we are to bear witness for Christ in this world. But help us, Lord, save us from being performers on a stage. Instead, may all that we say and all that we do be born from the time we spend in your presence each day. May it be real. And may people encounter Jesus Christ when they encounter us. And I pray, Lord, that your spirit would move in the lives of all of those here so that we would know how to follow you today. May your will be done. And we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me while we sing today?